I looked across my many bookshelves and I counted 37. I have 37 different books that each one are telling me, here is how you need to run your church. Each one of them, that's just the ones I kept. I have at least another 10 to 12 that I've given away or loaned out and never came back. Or, and these are the, and what all of them have in common, every single one of them, is a certain tone, a tone of certainty. Because whoever writes these books, they've gone through some sort of journey or experience, and they've come out the other side, and they've looked back and, and thought to themselves, that worked out well. Other people should do that. And they wrote down what happened from the viewpoint of it all has worked out. Here's the certainty of how it all came together. Let, you can now do what I do because I figured this all out. I get a little bit tired of this because I must confess I don't live with a lot of certainty. I spend a lot of my life grappling with what I don't fully understand, trying to do things I've never done before. The polite term for this is called a lifelong learner. Some of you have heard that term. What I think of it is flailing my way forward, hoping not to make a fool of myself. Lifelong learner has a better ring to it. What I find far more, far more helpful than, uh, than reading something by someone who has it all figured out is instead to go drink coffee with someone who's in the middle of it, in the middle of trying to figure out things just like I am. And, and those are the people I find just more helpful. And, and they're never the ones who write the books, right? The people who are in the middle of trying to figure something out are too busy doing it to write about it. And it's not until they're done that they then sit down and start writing. Like, so... What, like, if you think of, if you start at A and you're going to end up at D, like, I want to talk to people, I want the books written from people who are trying to figure out how to get from B to C. But, like, I don't want the person who's got it figured out. I want to talk, talk to someone who's in the middle of it. I found myself thinking about this as I was studying this week and, and reading for this sermon, this series of sermons, because there's a, a, a resemblance to the history of the early church. The early church, so Jesus, born yippee, right? 30 years later, gets some disciples together, starts doing his thing. 33 AD, uh, trial, crucifixion, resurrection, the disciples start going out and, and they, they start starting new churches and we get a few of the letters, the early letter, the letters of Paul as the churches figure out what's going on. That gets us like 50, 60 AD. And then we don't hear anything again until 200 or so AD. There's this, it's like the church goes into a tunnel and we just don't hear anything about it until it comes out on the other side. And if you went to a church around 200 AD, you would recognize it. Like at this point, there are bishops and they're gathering in buildings designed and built for worship. And uh, there would be communion weekly and they'd be singing some hymns. And I've gone, Olivia and I went to Italy before kids, and we would walk into a church, and I, I didn't recognize, the church was far different than anything I'd ever been in before, and they're speaking a language I don't know, but like, I could walk in and say, ah, that's church. Like, people are standing in a row, standing up, dude up front, preaching, like, I understood, ah, this is church. And so if you showed up 200 or so AD, you would say, yes, this is church. How did they get from here, yippee, I got 12 people in Jesus, to here? The church. Like, what happens in this tunnel in which we have very little documentation? They're too busy, like, doing it. They don't, they're not writing down how they're beginning this thing called church. They're busy trying to figure out, wait a minute, how do we do this? One of the only documents we have that tell us about this time in the tunnel, this time in between Jesus and church, as we would recognize it today, is in the letters of John. This is one of the only, the first, second, and third John uh, are uh, these letters, sort of a glimpse into what's happening. So let's talk about what that's a glimpse into. 
So, like, what, if you come out at 200 AD, at this point, there is very clearly, if you want to know who Jesus is, they would have handled, handed you something, something that said, here is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like we would do today. If, someone, if anyone wants to know who Jesus is, here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read them, let's talk. In the middle of this, before that, in, in the tunnel, when we're not quite sure how it's un unfolding, what we can tell, what we can guess is that there are individual communities that are having to figure out how to get people up to speed. Like someone shows up and says, yippee Jesus, how, well, tell me more. And, and so one community uh, puts together what we now call Matthew. And a different community is writing what we call Mark, right? They, each one arises in a different community because they, they've got to have a way to get people up to speed. And people are dying. Like, they have to write it down before they die. And, and so the, the Matthew community is writing... So, and we can look at how it's written, and we can sort of look behind it a bit and see, like, if it's written in this way, what were they concerned about? Like, Matthew uh, writes a lot about Jewish rituals and in Jewish context, so wherever Matthew was written was written by a guy who was working on how to bring Jews who didn't follow Jesus to become Jews who follow Jesus. And then if you look at Luke, Luke is a gospel, the gospel according to Luke doesn't say barely anything at all about Jewish culture. And so Luke is a gospel written to bring people who have never heard about Jesus or Judaism or anything about that, but they hear something cool is going on. And so Luke is written for non-Jews to become Christians. Right? Mark is the earliest one written. <clears throat> Mark is written just like, it's the Cliff Notes version. It's the shortest version. It's just the facts, ma'am. That's it. And it depends upon the rest of the community to fill in the blanks. <coughs> and then there's John. In the last century, century and a half, the three, of the, the three biggest arguments about the Bible have been around Genesis 1 through 11, who wrote Isaiah, and where does John come from? Like, we don't know. We have been struggling for over a century to figure out, like, what is the context from which John was written? We, we just aren't certain. What we do know is that at some point, Matthew and the church that uses Matthew hooks up with Mark, hooks up with Luke, hooks up with John, and all of them look at each other and say, that's good stuff. Like, I got Mark. I'll trade you a Mark for your Luke. And that's really helpful. Thank you. Like, at some point down the road, somewhere in this tunnel, they, they trade, like baseball cards, right? But when the letter of John is written, that hasn't happened yet. And so what, when we read the letter of John, what we're reading about is a letter written to a community that doesn't know about Matthew and Mark and Luke. They've got John. They have their way of telling the, 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 telling the story of Jesus. And they have a problem. Here's the problem. There are two churches. Now, how many churches are there in town right now? Five, six, right? That's, that, you don't seem to understand what it means when I say there are two churches. Think back to, like, Paul goes out to a community. He goes into the community, and he, sa he goes to the synagogue, and he goes to a bunch of Jews. Let me tell you about Jesus. And they go, ooh. That's cool. And, and then he goes to the marketplace and he gets some people together and says, let me tell you about Jesus. And, and they get them all together and they form the one church in that one town. They form the one church in that one town. And that's the church. And then Paul leaves. And, and then if that church has a problem, they write a letter to Paul. Paul writes them a letter back. We get a letter in the New Testament. But... In any one town, there is only one church, because Paul only starts one church in a town. Why would you start multiple churches in a town? You just go to town, you start a church, you move on. And so what's happening in, in this community that writes the Gospel of John, they're having the first argument about who Jesus is that has gotten so bad 
that the church has split. This is it. This is the first time that a group of Christians look at each other and say, I'm out. See ya. Right? When I say there are two churches in this town, this is the first time there has ever been two churches. And, and so they're, they're writing, this guy, guy who's writing uh, First John, he is like flabbergasted. It actually shows up in the lack of structure in the letter. The letter, you ever talk to someone and they're just so flabbergasted by something, they just kind of repeat themselves again and again and again. They just can't wrap their minds around what just happened. Like, that's the first John. There really isn't much of a structure to it because the guy just keeps on re repeating himself, repeating himself. It's... Uh, what he keeps on, John, first John is known as the letter that talks about love. And part of that is because the guy who's writing it, he, he's writing it in the church, and he's looking over there at that church. And he keeps on saying, but why don't you love us anymore? Wait a minute. Don't you love us? Why aren't you loving us? Aren't we both Christians? Why are you over there? Why aren't you loving us? Like, he keeps on coming back to love your brother. It's because there's a, a family split, and it has never happened before. And, and so the, the church has split, and, and he is just... It, why is it split, right? What, what's going on here? Why has it split? What has happened is... The gospel of, every gospel has a certain way of, of, of remembering who Jesus is. Like Matthew, what, just looking at what happens on the cross. Like Mark, when Mark tells about what happens on the cross, Mark has Jesus on the cross suffering, he doesn't say anything. Quick, he dies, moving on. Matthew, when Matthew has Jesus on the cross, Jesus is struggling. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that psalm then lands in faith, but like there's a whole different story, but we still very distinctly see Jesus is suffering. Right? In Luke, we see Jesus in the midst of his suffering saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. We, have a, we get to John, though, and John remembers what's happening on the cross. What John remembers is Jesus very serenely saying, uh, it is finished. It's like Jesus is looking around in the middle of doing something really important and says, yes, I now have assessed the situation and I decree that it has been completed. Like there's a very, like Jesus is portrayed as far more in control. Jesus is ta talks about voluntarily laying his life down. He's not being forced into this. He chooses this. John is the one... That when it tells about the beginning, like Matthew uh, gives you sweet baby Jesus cuddling alt manger, right? Luke gives you sweet baby Jesus, isn't that wonderful? John doesn't say anything about baby Jesus. John talks about the Word. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and everything was created through the Word. Like, we have this big cosmic understanding of Jesus who was it before all of creation, and so what is happening here is that this group that has split off is taking this good idea, Jesus has always been, and they're pushing it so far to say the fact that Jesus has always been and is Son of the Father, and we see that in his baptism, right? In Jesus' baptism, we hear the Father who says, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. And they're focused so much on that that they're leaving behind, you know, the cross, the suffering, humanity, right? They're getting so focused on Jesus was the one who created everything that they're just like leaving behind all the stuff about Jesus who forgives and suffers and who walks with us. And so they, they've split off, like they're saying Jesus is fully divine and they're just not paying attention to the humanity really at all. They... they they are lacking something important. It, it would be like playing football and insisting you only have three downs, right? Well, 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 do you, I could ask you, do you punt on third down? And you say, no, because you have fourth down. No, you don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Like, can you imagine that argument? Like, wait a minute. If you say you only have three downs, I don't know what you're playing, but it ain't football anymore. Like, that's what's happening. Like, here's the church saying Jesus, fully human, fully divine. And there, here's some people over here saying, well, he's really just divine. 
they're just they're not playing football anymore they're playing something else and, it, and, and the people over here are staring at him going what why aren't you loving us anymore what what happened to you like that that is the situation in, in uh first john and so the, the author of this letter, he keeps, on, he keeps on going through, why don't you love us anymore? And it is at the end of the letter, in the fifth chapter, that he is finally able to say, like he's able to get, articulate it pretty clearly. But Jesus was born of water and blood. Because the folks who have split off are all about, you know, Jesus was baptized, born, he shows us who the Father is, fully divine. And the author of 1 John is saying, but wait a minute, water and blood. He was born, but then he shed his blood as a consequence of our sins. Like water, you got to have both. <laughs> you, you gotta have both or else you're missing something essential about who Jesus is. Jesus isn't just born God, he was also died for sins, resurrected and, and leads us into a new, new life. It is a good thing to emphasize that Jesus is fully divine, but they have pushed it so far that it, it, it has go, become unhealthy. It, it doesn't work, right? What we see in this glimpse into the, the early church, like this time between uh, Jesus and the disciples in the year 200 when there is church, what this letter is, is a glimpse about how the early church is struggling with something we still struggle with today. The temptation to take Jesus and make him simple. To say, I got it, right? Jesus is, like, and in this situation, they're saying Jesus is fully divine and that's all you really need to know about Jesus. And the response of the church is to say, we don't understand all of it, but we have to hold on to it. We have to understand that Jesus is fully God and born of Mary, part of all of who created everything and then suffered, died, and resurrect, resurrected. And that this all, to hold this all together is a mystery. We don't fully understand it. That's how it is, though. We don't, and, and to this day, we still, I still hear people saying, you know, Jesus is a great teacher. No. If Jesus is only a teacher, then there are many other great teachers. I need a great teacher whose words have the authority of God. Or else there are many other people I could learn from, right? Jesus is not just a great teacher. He is the Son of God. I, this week, I read an interview with... Um, a president of a seminary on the East Coast talking about how that Jesus may have been resurrected bodily or may not have. But you know what? Jesus is just a sign of hope. No. Jesus was bodily resurrected. Period. Like, fully God, fully human, died for our sins, rose from the dead. We have to hold on to the fullness of this so that we can look down the road and say that there is a bodily hope for those who struggle and who, for whom this life is hard. Like, just before worship, I was hearing about someone who has suffered a stroke and is struggling with life. And to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to a, a, someone who is in their 50s and have had a stroke is not to say, well, you should have have some hope. No, it is to point at the bodily resurrection saying this is going to get fixed. This is going to be taken care of. In this life to come, your body will move how it ought to again. Right? My friends, certainty drives me up the wall. You might have guessed that, right? I would submit to you that the most helpful way to follow Jesus is to leave behind the certainty of those 37 books that all want to tell me exactly what to do. Be a little bit less certain. Be a little bit more uh, understanding that this is a mystery. Let's be less certain and let's be a little bit more focused on following Jesus, who is always mysterious. Less certainty, more Jesus. Amen.